up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk podcast. Joined as always by Phil Perry. We got a lot to get to today. Well, maybe not a lot, but we want to go in depth on the things the Patriots might be able to do to get better between now and the start of camp. Who are some of the guys who are out there? What kind of moves could they make financially? And and where would they want to do it? But first, we got some breaking news from uh, Casa Phil. Phil, what just happened? I just I'm just a dummy. I just dropped my laptop right in my foot so you might have to make a visit to um ye old milton hospital in a few minutes here but right now we'll just we'll just plow through we continue to pod no matter is the it, odds is it just straight numb right now i mean um is it no robin something no yeah no it hurts but you can't tell because i'm a professional so it's funny because you know phil said that the place that the laptop fell was where the bony part where the big toe connects Mm. And I immediately understood that particular pain as opposed to the pain of the area, which is soft right between the bump in the middle of your foot and your toes. If you drop something there where it really digs in, that hurts. And it feels differently from if you did hit the bony bump on the front top of your foot. I think everybody understands my pain now. And listen, if you want to send, I don't know, some sort of care package my way, just feel free to find the uh, the address for NBC Sports Boss, and I'll be able to pick up everything there. Awesome. And it's Mother's Day, so um, remember that, folks. All right, Phil, <laughs> you heard the intro. Um, you know, the Patriots right now, the business that they're in is taking a look at their roster, taking a look at the guys who they've brought in, and over the next few weeks saying, okay, this is our projected depth chart if we had a game on Sunday. That, obviously, that's going to change quite a bit, but you have to start to spitball on what you have. And what the Patriots will do is they're going to find places that they're light. They're going to find places that they want competition. And they're going to find, hopefully, maybe some diamonds in the rough. And they're going to bring them all in. We'll see who sticks. But as for guys who were brought in for competition, Cam Newton, perfect example. Patriots had no intention of bringing Cam Newton in. Turned around in mid-June and said, you know what, we could probably bring somebody in to compete with Hoyer and Stidham. Cam is still there. We weren't interested in him on a longer-term deal at expensive money, but I wonder if he'd come in as competition now because he might be better than those guys. So he's sitting there, might as well do it. They did it. They ended up paying him, Phil, $3.75 million in 2020. That is the ultimate Band-Aid because whether or not you thought he was terrific, he started 15 games accounted for like 20 touchdowns, took all the slings and arrows, was the perfect bridge quarterback. The other guy, Malcolm Butler, um, came in on a tryout. Patriots worked him out. He signed nine months later. He's making a pick in the Super Bowl that might be the most historic play at the end of a Super Bowl game. So with all that in mind, and I know I bam, rambled a little there, where would you think the Patriots would try to key on in terms of finding either developmental guys or more specifically, let's go get a veteran. Where would they maybe want to try and do that? The one spot that I thought they would address during this draft that they really did not was on the edge. Uh, to me, there are no clear answers after Matt Judon. And even Matt Judon, I mean, listen, he's on the roster. He's going to be a starter. He's going to play a lot. They're hoping he's going to contribute a lot. They did not get a lot from him down the stretch. And so you look at that, okay, fine. Maybe you're getting the guy you got the first half of the season – what they have after Matt Judon right now, to me, is completely uncertain. Josh Uche, Ronnie Perkins, Anthony Jennings, whoever you want to throw into that mix and say that guy can play on the edge, I'm not sure anybody knows what they're getting there. So that, to me, would have been a spot to address in the draft, Tom. And now that mm -hmm. they did not, I would think it would be one of those places that they're looking for real veteran help. All right, I'm going to give you names. I don't need a full scouting report. You're not the director of pro scouting over there. But I'm going to ask uh, for a firmness level from you for each guy I name. Firmness level, 0 to 10. The Davian Clowney, not an edge guy necessarily because he's a good run stopper, going to be expensive as shit. I would say no chance at all. He comes here, but firm. So when you say firm, you just mean how much do I like him? Yeah. <laughs> The, so firm, the firm like idea. I, I'm, yeah, I'm picturing you. Okay, it's a firm idea. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, I would say that's a that's a three. Okay, because of the money. Yeah, yeah. All right, Akeem Hicks, interior guy again, can crush a pocket, not the edge. 
I'm going to get to the pure edge guys in a second. But Akeem Hicks, he's 32 now. And here's the thing with Clowney. Ain't coming. Nine sacks, 19 quarterback hits. He played for like $9 million last year. He's going to look for more. Akeem Hicks, though, 32. Hasn't been able to stay healthy, um, missing 20 games the last couple of years. But um, in the last three years, he's missed 20 games. But still a good interior pocket crusher and can play and loved it here when he was here in 2015. I love this idea. Now, we just said money was probably going to be an issue with Jadavion Clowney. The reality is, Tom, money's probably going to be an issue with any of these guys that we mentioned right now because the Patriots don't even have enough available cap space to sign their rookie class. Uh -huh. And I believe our guy Miguel said that they're going to need about $13 million to be freed up just so that they can A, sign the rookie class, and then B, operate during the regular season. So, so that's before we're even getting into bringing a guy aboard which means if he brings a cap hit, even if he's at the veteran minimum with incentive-laden deal, yeah, well, you can still do that sh stuff for a million. But right with a cap hit of a million, but with dead money. But, but, you, yeah. but you might need to send somebody else out, you yep. know, to be able to bring one of these guys in. So We'll talk about uh, Nelly. We'll talk about Nelly in a minute. But just to, on the say, spitball that they were able to clear the space, Akeem Hicks. I love it. I love it. I, I'd put that at a seven. Uh, Justin Houston. I think the party's kind of over. Pure pass rusher. Started 15 games last year with Baltimore. Um, 33 years old. I don't know if you want him taking snaps ahead of somebody who might be more explosive when you – the thing that's – to me, the thing that holds Josh Uche back is simply experience, not full-on talent, right? So I'm not huge on Justin Houston. Your thoughts? Yeah, I would put that maybe, maybe a, a step above Clowney because I assume you'd be able to get him pretty cheap, but I'm still just around like a five there. I have three high excitement levels now to close this out. Oh, okay. Firm, firm, firm. I think it's going to be Jerry Hughes, 34 years old, right? Only had two sacks last year with the Bills, longtime menace to the Patriots. Even though he only had the two sacks, the athletic beat writer whose name is escaping me right now and the story that I read by Shield Capadia from The Athletic when I did this story and looked at all the guys – said he was by far their best edge player last year. I think Jerry Hughes at 34 added to the mix as a situational guy. We'll love it. I'm with you. Set That's a seven and a half or an eight for me. Because again, the combination of his age and what you think he'd be able to, to command on the open market, I think that could be a marriage between the skill set you need at a price point that is relatively reasonable. Trey Flowers, 29. Smartest one to add? Simple, right? Should be plug and play if he can still wander around. <laughs> yeah, it should be. It should be. He, You know, the question is the health. And I would say the other additional little wrinkle here is that the scheme is different from the last time right. Trey Flowers was here. They, those edge guys that they have now are more true outside linebacker types. And when I think of Trey Flowers, I think of more of a 4-3 a defensive end who's, you know, not going to be dropping into coverage and doing those sorts of things. Now, they did play Trey Flowers as a stand-up outside linebacker in Detroit, too, so it's not like he can't do it. Um, I think getting back to it, the, the real question is just how much how much does he have, how healthy is he? But, yeah, again, I think I would think this is a an inexpensive guy that you know, you love what he brings to the locker room. When he's right, he can be a real nuisance, so – this is probably the one that I like the most. I, I would go I would go solid eight here for Trey Flowers. Here's one thing to bear in mind, too, as we speak in a vacuum about guys they can't afford. Uh, <laughs> think about the back end. If they're playing zone, that means that they're going to need pressure. They can't just, you know, mush rush and, and let somebody wander around, especially when you're playing zone. I mean, man, too. I mean, but, you know. When you're playing zone, there's holes. And if you give a quarterback time, eventually somebody's going to sit down in that area. Same thing to break open against man. But the point is, you need to get home kind of quick. So do you look at a pure pass rusher like a Jerry Hughes or whoever else more favorably than a Trey Flowers, who's kind of a systemish guy, or this last guy, Carl Nassib, who was released by the Raiders. Long, active player who really skidded with 
Baltimore after having a couple of really good seasons with Tampa Bay, but he skidded the last two years. He's only 29. Smart guy, once was productive, plays a ton of special teams. Just like you said, I mean, wh- why not bring a veteran in here? I mean, the guy I keep thinking of, Phil, is Dietrich Wise. What's his role right now? How is that different? Why would you need another edge mm-hmm. guy instead of Dietrich Wise? Well, I would say the role that Wise plays that that makes him valuable for this team is even though he is a little bit of a a big picture scheme misfit, you know, he's not a true three, four outside linebacker. There are going to be situations where where you're in sub defense and you're not going to have five guys on the line with, you know, your three, four with your, your three defensive linemen and your two outside linebackers all there on the line. You're just going to have four guys on the line and it's going to look more like a four, three. And so when you're in those spots, having Dietrich wise to play on the edge makes a lot of sense. Now, do you need two of those guys? You know, I guess maybe in case Dietrich wise ends up getting injured, but that feels like his role right now. Uh, is that edge guy in some situations you can even kick him inside in obvious passing mm-hmm. situations to work against guards that are much stubbier. So um, that's his value, and I wonder. I, like I wonder He's if unique. Nassib would be similar. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is, you know, when we talk about pure pass rushers, to use a, a for instance of pure pass rushing, and I always kind of harken back to when guys Robert Quinn and Dwight Freeney. Okay, you got two guys on the edge who are just full on coming up field. The Patriots are probably not going to play defense like that. They don't go at breakneck pace to get to the quarterback. They're probably going to want to curb Matt Judon's tendency to, you know, run as far outside as he can to try and work back. It creates too many lanes on the outside for a quarterback to run through. But I think they could stand to use more diabolical pass rush. (laughs) Um, Contributions. If they can get a Rob Nikovich clone someplace, somewhere, Perfect. George Karloftis might have been another reasonable pick in the first round, Phil. I mean, he was there. He was there, right? Yeah, he was there still with Cole Strange on the board. Um, let's scoot to guard. You spoke to Cole Strange's uh, college coach this week. What's your comfort level, Phil? On the next Pats podcast, he did that. What's your comfort level with Cole Strange being a week one starter? Well, they need him to be <laughs> your first round pick at that position. You, you better be starting and starting early. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with it. He's he is more than athletic enough to be able to handle that. I think the only thing that I've heard from scouts in terms of you know why certain teams had him as a a middle round pick was a little bit because of his quote unquote anchor Tom. And I'm mm-hmm. not going to pretend I'm a I'm a offensive line scout or an offensive line coach, but I think that is one of the questions about. Cole Strange is, you know, when he sees NFL power consistently, how well does he hold up coming from the level of competition that he's coming from at Chattanooga? So uh, I would say you've got to just, even if you do have concerns about that, if you're the Patriots, you took him in the first round, you have to swallow hard and, and play him there. It's time to have, you know, we, we all had the, the reaction that we had to that pick when it happened, but now he is what he is. He's a first round pick that comes with first round pick expectations. And so the expectation has to be that he starts right away. You know what I'm going to call the marquee matchup of uh, minicamp when the pads come on and training camp? Christian Barmore v. Cole Strange. Let's see how that goes. That'll be interesting. Because that's what might be his Achilles heel, Cole Strange's. At this point, Achilles heel means a forever kind of situation, a developmental spot. And I think that Christian Barmore would be the ideal example. He toasted everybody last year in, in training camp. It was bizarre to watch how dominant Christian Barmore was in one-on-ones, but Cole Strange is going to be dipped in the cauldron there. Um, so that being the case, there's not a lot of offensive linemen out there. Um, Dwayne Brown is a Pro Bowl tackle. They don't need him. He's a $12 million player. Eric Fisher started at Indy last year. He's a tackle. I'm not going to bring him in. I still do think a tackle does make some sense for depth. Daryl Williams, a Bills guy released by the Bills, 6'6", 330. He can move around. Patriots don't generally want to have a massive 330-pound guy at guard because they do so much pulling. Um, And also Riley Reef, 33. um, He was a one-year deal starting left tackle. Uh, He can start at left and right tackle. But a lot of these guys are too good, too expensive to be brought in as part-time players. Yeah, that's what I would assume. Like Daryl Williams to me is a perfect Patriot because he – 
does play guard as well as tackle. You know him well from his time in the AFC East. And he, to me, when free agency was beginning, I, I thought it was really worth asking, do you bring in Trent Brown, who is very, very good when he's on the field? Definitely do not want to take that away from the guy, but might cost a little bit more than somebody like Williams. When Williams has proven he can stay on the field and Brown really hasn't, mm -hmm. you know, that, that to me made him a reasonable choice to, to be your starting right tackle in 2022. And the fact that he's still out there and he does bring that versatility, that would, that would make a lot of sense to me. But again, it's going to come back to how much are these guys expecting? We are through, I mean, we're all assuming Tom that these guys are going to make real money, but we are through the, we're through free agency. There's not a yep. lot of money left at a lot of these places. So all of these players markets may be down to an extent. It's just a question of how far down are they? It's funny when you think of Trent Brown, say if he's making, um, what is his, his deal? They reworked it. Be that as it may, let's just operate off this. It's like eight or 9 million, 10 million. If he's carrying a cap hit, are you looking for me? I'm looking at it right now. You're a good yeah. dude. Um, Prorate whatever he's making, multiply it by two, multiply the salary by two, and uh, or, or divide it by nine games because that's generally what he's been playing. So the cap hit, the salary, all of that per game is what you're spending on that spot. Yeah, it's and it's not quite as much as you know for just looking at the the value. And there are a lot of incentives built in, right, right. in terms of play time. Heavy guy incentives, um, but. He's on a base salary this coming season that's just 1.5. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was given a – boy, his signing bonus was just 2.5 million. So he's got a lot in terms of per-game roster bonuses um, so that and way other they bonuses. Hedge so. At least they hedge it as, as opposed to how, for instance, the Raiders might have done it when they had him out there and he was playing half the games. You end up costing twice as much. Is that right? Whatever. You're, yeah, I mean, it's just – it's it's – an insane cost. If you have a fifty million dollar cap hit for a guy who's playing eight games, it's just bananas because it's per game a lot more. Let's look at linebacker. The Patriots have Dante Hightower has not been signed. We haven't really heard any murmurs that he's going anywhere else. We haven't heard any murmurs either that he's going to retire. But if the Patriots want to have a thumper behind Jawan Bentley, who's a little younger, similar sized guy. I don't know if he's that different, but he's probably less expensive than Hightower would be. Alexander Johnson, AJ Johnson, 30 year old linebacker with the Denver Broncos, 6'2, 245. He'd play for short money. That's a name out there. One other, Phil, Anthony Barr, longtime staple of the Minnesota Vikings, second level, great coverage guy, great pass rush guy, um, became a cap casualty because he was getting hurt too often and he really would like to probably finish his career in Minnesota but those are the linebacker names do you think the Patriots even should shop at linebacker or should they just sort out what the hell they have <laughs> I think they probably should just sort out what they have though I would say Barr to me is another name that I thought going into free agency this would be somebody that would really fit what they do gives them what they've wanted in guys like Hightower and in Van Noy and in Jamie Collins, somebody who plays on the edge, but he also plays off the line. He's good against the run. He's not quite the uber athlete he was a few years ago. I want to say he made three or four consecutive Pro Bowls, Tom. Yeah. Um, but I think would be a really good fit here. It's just, is that a position you want to spend money on when – you have these other areas of need that are probably a little bit more expensive and that probably mean a little bit more to the overall health and well-being of, of your team. You know, we, we've talked about linebacker, and I thought for sure the Patriots were going to want a linebacker because Bill Belichick loves linebackers. But, you know, I, I said this at the time, even though I mocked Quay Walker from Georgia to the Patriots in the first round, is it something I would do, even though I really like that player and I like the fit for New England? Probably not, just because that position is what it is in today's game. And so that that might be one I would be adding to last. And if there's money and there's an opening and there's a perfect fit, then you go and attack it. I'm not sure I'd make it a priority right now. I really have a feeling that if the Patriots were stretching their hamstrings right now to do a victory lap over any player to say, I told you so on, it would be Cam McGrown. Fifth round pick last year from Michigan. You watch the highlights. He's a 230-pound player, but you've watched, watched the highlights from Michigan. Explosive, hits hard, runs well. 
Um, ACL that he suffered kept him off the field last year entirely. So the Patriots got him in the fifth round, but they're probably looking at him and going, uh, Nicobe Dean, you know, Quay Walker, any of these guys? We, we think we got that in Cam McGrone, plus we just get to spend have him spend an entire year getting used to the defense. So I think Cam McGrone might be the most important – yeah, that's, that's an overstatement. One of the most important players on the Patriots. I got four linebackers for you. We have gotten away from the firmness quotient. That's okay. We really don't need to go back to that. Here's four linebackers, all plus 33. We're 33 or, or over. Janoris, Jack Rabbit Jenkins. These are corners. Corners, corners. What did I say? Linebackers. Yeah, these guys can't play linebacker. Uh, Jack Rabbit Jenkins, Joe Hayden, Bobby Alford, and Jason McCourty. Those are four guys. Now, with the Patriots already stocked with short guys like Janoris Jenkins and Robert Alford, um, <laughs> or do you need more guys? Look, I'd bring Jason McCourty back in a second when I look at his production while he was out there and his knowledge of the defense. But obviously, if the Patriots wanted to bring him back a couple of years ago, they would have done so, and he ended up in Miami. So do you think they need to dip in to this cornerback class still? I don't think it would be a bad idea to – to bring in somebody who can play on the outside because to me, you're so well stocked with slots and safeties that can play in the slot and good tacklers and undersized guys in there. Uh, so I would be looking at maybe one more, but Tom, they're already at a point where, and none of these guys are long-term answers. Don't get me wrong, but you have Malcolm Butler, you have Jalen Mills, you have Terrence Mitchell, you know, that's, that's, I think going to be your three. Like it or not, you know, your opportunity came and went in the first round to go get somebody that you really love who's dynamic and athletic and gives you hope for the future at that position. I think if you were adding anybody there now, it would probably be somebody that's already kind of on the Mitchell level. Mm -hmm. So unless that really doesn't yeah. work out in the spring or early in training camp, Tom, I'm not sure they're going to be making a big time addition there. Phil, give me your recipe for clearing um, ten million dollars in cap space. Uh, I would be probably extending Hunter Henry. I personally would be extending John Jones, who I like, uh, but they just took at least one slot corner in the draft and Mark Jones, and another corner who played outside in college is very light. You know, Jack Jones, I think actually probably a better fit on the outside, all in all honesty. I know he's mm -hmm. undersized, and people that worked with him at the Shrine Bowl think he's a he's a nickel corner. I, I'm not sure how you can play nickel if you're as light as he is, because you do have to tackle. No doubt. Um listen, same thing for Marcus Jones, though. He's another light guy that I think is only going to be able to play inside. So we'll see on that front. But I, I think you, you can extend a couple guys that you think are good players that are still young enough that you like well enough to help you clear some space. So Henry and John Jones would be at the top of the list for me. And then there are a few guys, Tom, you can take and you can tweak their contracts and, and turn salary into signing bonus and move things around that way. Matt Judon's at the top of the list there for me because I think he's probably the, the biggest money player where that would be a factor. Uh, but I'm sure there are a handful of others where you could do that as well. And now all of a sudden you're talking about a good chunk of cap space being clear. Nelson Aguilar is a fixation, and I don't blame people because he's carrying a $15 million cap hit as it stands. Here's what happens with Nelson Aguilar in order for the Patriots to tweak it. If they trade him, that would be best case scenario financially. $9 million salary comes off the books. You carry $5 million in dead money against the cap, but it's still, you're saving about $10 million on the cap, so the zing zang. We'll see how many teams want to take him, if any, if the Patriots wanted to trade him on a $9 million salary, given that he's about a 35 catch a year guy, except for the outlier season with Oakland in 2020. Now, they could release him, means the Patriots are going to save about $5 million and still carry a $10 million cap hit. Okay, so, you, so you're saving $5 million. You are million saving some money, right. You're also not having to pay, which could, you know, we don't think about that often. That means Robert Kraft doesn't have to pay $9 million to a player who might be a bit player. He's carrying a $10 million cap hit, but okay, that's paperwork. Um, but maybe the least appealing aspect of this is to carry 
Nelson Aguilar as is at $9 million with a $15 million cap hit if he's going to be a bit player for the Patriots. So it's a conundrum the Patriots are in because they needed wide receivers so desperately they had to shop in an okay, not great market in 2020, 2020. And Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne were the signings. Bourne is one of the best yards after catch guys in the league, that was excellent last year, everything to like about him. Aguilar has been a 2.7 as a free agent signing. So what are your thoughts on, on what to do there? And we'll wrap it up. Yeah, the, the $9 million base salary that goes with him, even if he's traded, even with, Tom, the, the receiver market exploding the way that it has, it still is not good value. I mean, and you look at some of the, the other guys. Either. Yeah, and those teams, right. Those teams have mostly spent their money. So, you know, Robert Woods is making 10 million bucks a year. I know he's coming off an injury, but Marcus Valdez Scantling, who just signed, is is nine million dollars a year. Tyler Boyd, who's a very good slot player and one of the best offenses in the league right now, is a shade under nine million bucks this year in terms of cash. So I, I think teams are gonna look at that and say, Boy, I mean, we're not opposed to spending that much on a second or third receiver. But Nelson Aguilar looks like he's the fifth receiver on one of the weakest receiving cores in football right now. So why would we do that? Uh, to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I wonder, is there is there any way that he would knock that number down? I, I just, I don't see it, Tom. I, I just, I don't know how they keep him at that number and keep him given the, the way the rest of the receiver room works or looks right now. But I also don't know what you do with it. I, you might just have to swallow hard and just say, boy, that was a mistake and just sit them, you know, and just ha have them there for insurance. Yeah. And again, that's, that's the crazy thing. $15 million against the cap for insurance and writing a $9 million over 17 games, just every Friday, here goes the check. I don't know if they get paid on Fridays, but um, it's just, a, it's just, it ends up looking like, especially where their cap situation is now. And where we're looking at these other positions and oh, they could use an edge guy. Oh, they might could, you know, maybe could use a linebacker. Maybe could use the reason, or one of the reasons you're not able to do that is, is because you spent a lot of money on Nelson Aguilar. And I understand and why he you did jumps, it. He jumps off the page. I get it why you did it at the time, but it's just, it's, it's just such an obvious whiff right now. At least it looks it that way. All goes back again, as we talked about with, whether it be Cole Strange or the tight ends or the, whatever, the draft decisions made previously impacted the draft decisions made now. Draft decisions made previously impacted the wide receiver room and the free agent shopping in the past. Nelson Aguilar, a good point. And, and I just, you know, for me to call it a whiff, who cares what I think? I think the Patriots are telling you that too when they draft a receiver in the second round to essentially play the same role. Let's go in depth on <clears throat> Tuesday when we see you again on Tyquan Thornton. Starting to get firmer about him. You feeling okay. better about him? I think so. Our our, our guy uh, Evan Meshpoint Lazar did a breakdown that I watched. Yeah, and uh, Smash Concept, all that stuff. <laughs> I love Evan. He loves his he loves his chalk talk. Um, Listen, he's he's, he's he he, is, he has rare rare speed. Tom, there's nobody in the history Evan of the combine. He. he <laughs> Uh, no, Tyquan Thornton. I don't know what Evan's speed is like. I'm sure it's good. I don't know if it's rare. Stubby uh, steps are no one in the history of the combine measured over six feet. Listen, to, listen to this fast fact from Phil. Ooh, fast fact from Phil. Perfect. Fast fact from Phil. Last uh, 20 ish years combine data from 1999 provided by mockdraftable.com. Great website. Only four receivers measured over six feet. And under 185 pounds, so in in 20 plus years, and they're actually receivers you would know. It's Devontae Smith, very recent, D.D. Westbrook, Brandon Lloyd, and Mario Manningham. So those are the four. None of those guys really came close to running anywhere near as fast as Tyquan Thornton did in the 40. So he is quite literally something the NFL has has maybe never seen before, Tom, in terms of his frame and his speed. Now whether that's good or not. We'll see, you know, being fast is good. Usually being light, being lean is not so good. That's why there are so few of those guys in the NFL. But I think it is a rare enough combination that it it makes him intriguing, right? You have 6'2", as opposed to Philip Dorsett or Demir Bird, 
who are five nine, five ten, and running really fast forty times as well. What do you? What's the nose got over there? What are you sniffing? I smell Taekwon Thornton Tuesday. We're going in depth on Taekwon Thornton next Tuesday. Okay. All right. All right. We're out of here. Make sure you listen to the next Pats podcast. Phil does, as always, a great job. He got Cole Strange as college coach. And uh, we'll see you soon. Have a great weekend. Happy Mother's Day to all your moms.